When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truths with Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Have you ever had a colleague, family member, or friend who smoked and was agitated close to their smoke break, or if they otherwise couldn't grab a cigarette? Or you may know someone who struggles with alcohol and has trouble resisting a or many drinks. Perhaps you have similar feelings, but they are directed towards cookies, chips, or other kind of carbs. We haven't labeled the staples of the American diet as an addictive substance for many reasons. On one hand, our agricultural policy and food production that revolves genetically altered crops that produce cheap carbohydrates represents a bigger lobby and more electoral votes than tobacco, whose powerful lobby allowed cigarettes to be marketed as a healthy way to relax and safe for years, including by doctors, <laughs> despite widespread evidence to the contrary. In addition to not being regulated, the sugar industry gets an estimated $4 billion in annual subsidies, courtesy of U.S. taxpayers. On the other hand, lobbies and food politics aside, food addiction and consequences require a more nuanced approach than abstinence as is possible for cigarettes and alcohol. We die if we avoid food completely, and food is much more fundamentally woven into our culture and earliest memories than alcohol or cigarettes, which in all cultures are generally adulthood indulgences. Do you remember summers at the pool with Swedish fish or warm, salty, soft pretzels from the snack shack or holidays with grandma's amazing mac and cheese or dad's famous mashed potatoes or like me, Friday night pizza huts where you cashed in your book at reward for reading five books to a free personal pan pizza. Chances are, if you scan your memory, some of your best, warmest memories involve sugar, associating this ingredient with pleasure, celebration, ritual, and reward. And for the purposes of this season, by sugar, I mean what we think of as traditional sugar, like sodas, candies, cakes, and added sugar in processed foods, like salad dressing, breads, pretzels, and other salty carbs. On the flip side, your most difficult memories probably also involve sugar as a source of refuge. If like me, after another day of being bullied and isolated from, quote, the cool kids at school, you found bagels in the fridge to eat and numb the pain of being othered, or right before a spinal tap to see how far your cancer had spread, your parents took you to the pancake house to try and bring some sort of comfort during the scariest health scare you've ever had. And who can forget snack wells, a dieter's low-fat bonanza where we thought we could eat the whole box because it was low-fat, not realizing that all the sugar was making us hungrier and hungrier. Sugar has comforted most of us when we were isolated, in the midst of chaos, or for many of my clients, it was a lift when being emotionally neglected. Food companies methodically and relentlessly advertise to make us trust sugar and let these processed foods into our lives in a way not only without a warning label like cigarettes, but actually in a way we now come to seek out. As a result, what was once only used in a way that we use spices today, a little dab will do ya, is now the staple of our collective diets. And while now it's recommended to limit sugar, food companies didn't create but can capitalize on our Puritan, Christian, and capitalistic narrative of sacrifice equals reward to ignore the mind-body connection and the need for emotional intelligence and agility. Adding insult to injury, we as taxpayers are paying to make ourselves and the environment, which is degraded immensely with our monoculture agriculture focused on sugar, corn, soy, and wheat that will be processed into sugar and well. We're subsidizing ecological collapse and the resulting pandemics like coronavirus. The decline of our personal and environmental bodies has led to an overtaxed healthcare system that was never designed for the chronic diseases which in large part driven by our food supply and its consequences. In this season 11 of Insatiable, we will look at how we as individuals and a collective can go to sugar rehab, physically and emotionally. We will explore how we arrived here, root causes of sugar addiction, if sugar is really addictive, and can we eat it moderately and how we can move forward with sugar and its proper pace in our life, and what does that look like for you? Without further ado, let's enter sugar rehab together. Welcome, everybody, to season 11 episode of Insatiable, How to Exercise to Prevent Sugar Cravings with Alisa Biddy. We have so many beliefs about working out, and these beliefs come from stories that our body is a machine. 
And because this story dominates often, we also don't hear the story of the miracle and ebb and flow of women's bodies and how our hormonal dance influences how we work out, eat, parent, and work. To help tell us a more exciting and untold story, we have Elisa here on the show today, who's a repeat guest because she's amazing, to educate, inspire, and fill in some major missing holes to how we understand our female bodies, zeroing in on the connection between how we exercise and our sugar cravings. Here is a brief bio of Elisa. She is the author of the new book, In the Flow, which I've recommended to so many clients and my own insatiable community. In the Flow, unlock your hormonal advantage and revolutionize your life. Elisa is a women's hormone and functional nutrition expert and pioneer in female biohacking. She is the best-selling author of Women Code and creator of the Cycle Sinking Method, a female-centric diet and lifestyle program that leverages hormonal patterns for optimal health, fitness, and productivity. Thank you so much for being here today, Elisa. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So I want to open up with what I just love about your book is the, the feminine, your, all your books is the feminine enlightenment. Let's put it this way. <laughs> but you talk about being in school and learning and, and, and I'm not going to quote the exact passage, but you quote in the book, in the flow, you know, you learn that the testes are this powerhouse of efficient production and they produce, you know, two to 300 million sperm toes at daily and how the men's reproductive system is just kind of glorified. And then you read this kind of, you know, after the development and release of one egg from the ovary, the female reproductive process is twofold. You know, if basically if we don't get pregnant, then the lining shed and is lost and the cycle begins again. And you talk about how what you wanted to read was, and I'm going to just quote a little bit of it. I love this. The female reproductive system is the crowning achievement of human evolution and reproduction. Efficient and highly adaptable, seven hormones work in symphonic relationship to cause four highly refined processes to take place in a given monthly cycle. When conception does occur, the process of gestation is absolutely breathtaking. You go on and on, you know, how the process of labor and delivery, one that seems to pose extreme physical danger, is the peak example of how women's bodies transform into a channel of power to safely deliver the baby and preserve themselves. And so can we just open up with that? I just love that perspective and why we don't hear that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so funny. I... Because of my upbringing, and which was simply that I received no negative, no any, like nothing. I I was not given any conversation about menstruation or it being a curse or body stuff or anything about sex. I, I came to all of these things really in this innocent and neutral kind of way. And I was also raised in an environment with, without sisters, with two brothers and a father who had a really positive relationship with his own mother. So I was sort of just in this environment where everybody was treated the same and expected to, to become self-confident, you know, people, right? It was, it, was, it was very, in a way, a very gender equal home environment that I was raised in by no means perfect, but there were a lot of good things about that from my point of view now, especially later on in my adult years, seeing, looking back on that. And one of the things that it created was this effect whenever I would encounter the cultural narrative, it was very jarring. I found it very strange and odd. Like, for example, everybody knows about the, the sex ed class, the first sex ed class I had in sixth grade where they talked about periods. And I had not heard a word about it until that moment and was awestruck at how extraordinary this was and how lucky I was that I was going to be the the gender that got to have a period. And then I quickly scanning the room of my female co-students saw that they had a completely different reaction. And I found that really weird. Like what why are they reacting so negatively to this is extraordinary? Similarly, when I got to middle school and we were reading about reproduction, which as I write in, in the flow, I was so excited to learn more about this thing I was already so excited about from sixth grade. When I read the language about the sperm production and the testes, I was like, okay, great. Yep. Awesome. Human body is awesome. Great. I had no 
that felt right that it was so the language had a lot of pride in it and you know like excitement about its capacity and then i got to the female part and it was so the opposite it was so laden with this sense of like failure if you don't reproduce and so much waste like oh you know the sperm are fit this testes are efficient constantly in production but the uterus it's not very efficient because if there's no baby in there then it's just wasting time and wasting blood and you know i was like what my whole reaction to that was who wrote this (laughs) this is wrong they got this wrong my instinct was that I couldn't accept it the way that it was presented because I had a completely different experience of things, even at such a young age that like, it couldn't be true that it was this sad thing that was being described. And it turns out it's not quite the opposite, (laughs) but that stuck with me of like, oh, hmm. And and it's only continued as, as, as I've gone through life to see that for, for example, even just with sex and sexual pleasure and women having agency over their own orgasm, most women, you know, we've adopted a cultural narrative that like there's something to avoid, quote unquote, down there, you know, it's dirty or it's somebody else has to do it or whatever. We have these negative associations with it. And I remember the first time I encountered that with my high school friend who, who had just had sex for the first time with her boyfriend, I think it was senior year. They had been together for two years and I was like, tell me how it was because I didn't have a boyfriend and I wasn't yet sexually active. And so I wanted to know because I was so fascinated by this whole reproductive system. I was like, how was it? How many orgasms did you have? Congratulations. And she, she was like, yeah, it was fine. And I was like, well, didn't you help him know what to do? And she's like, you know, what are you talking about? I was like, well, didn't you tell him what to do? Did you, did you do it yourself? So, you know, while he was doing whatever else he was doing, you were making sure you had an orgasm. And she's like, no, that's dirty. And I literally had no point of reference for what she meant by dirty, again, because of my upbringing. And I was left to my own innocent self-discovery. And I said, oh, well, t- you know, just take a shower first. That's no big deal. I, I, I could not understand what she meant was that that was somehow bad. You know, and and I said, and she was like, no, obviously I showered, and I was like, well, then what do you mean? She's like, like that's gross, and I was like, what? Huh? I, I, I the same exact reaction I had to watching my friends in sixth grade being like, oh no, the curse is here, and not understanding why they felt that way. The same reaction I had when I read the the material in junior high of like somebody was like drunk when they wrote this. This is not accurate. <laughs> and it was the same reaction I had senior year of high school. My b- good friend had sex for the first time and told me that touching her clitoris was dirty. I was like, is everybody crazy? What is happening? And so, yeah, every time I confront the cultural narrative, which spouts toxic mythology about women, women's bodies, women's metabolism. Today, we're going to talk a lot about your metabolism. For example, the, myth- the toxic mythology about your metabolism is that it's slower compared to men, which is not true. Every time I confront this in conversation with people or in academic literature or in the media, in articles, it's like a slap in the face, like, whoa, oh, no, 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 you know, we're getting this so wrong and it's hurting so many women and it's got to stop. Yeah, I think that's one of the, I interviewed Laura McGowan and we were, she is in her book, uh, We Are the Luckiest is About Sobriety. And we were talking about the cultural myths around alcohol and how when you start to recognize how wrong the cultural norms and narratives are, it can be so isolating, can it? Because every, you're seeing the same thing as other people, but the meaning is so different. <laughs> and it's like, you got to bring people along with you and kind of be that voice. And that's, it's, it can be exhausting and isolating <laughs> doing um, that. I think I can appreciate how that maybe can be the case for people. I have never felt that way. I think I've maybe because I had started such a young age that this is not I don't know anything else, but it's never felt isolating. It's felt oh, like the basis upon which I am able to connect and form relationships and find community and share my gifts. And yeah, I, really? I have a different take on it for me, but I, I, I do appreciate that for some people, especially with the alcohol thing that, you know, that that can feel socially isolating. But, you know, I think it comes down to, 
if you've been indoctrinated as a young woman, a young girl, to be a good girl, then, you know, that's going to set you up for a lot of challenges. For example, good girls, let's take in the, the case of alcohol. Good girls, you know, don't rock the boat. If the host offers you a glass of wine, you say, yes, thank you. Right? That's being yeah. a good girl. And so if you want to not drink, the part of you that's been conditioned for decades to be a good girl is going to pretty much win, right? And you're going to say, yes, okay, thank you, and feel the peer pressure and that that you should somehow subvert your needs and desires to make other people happy because you've been conditioned to be a people pleaser. I was fortunate enough not to get that conditioning heavily at home. Certainly you get it in the environment around you. So I don't mind being disruptive. Oh, I, don't, I don't find that that's a, actually a real problem. So I don't mind doing things that are supposedly disruptive, like saying, no, I don't drink. Because I don't, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And I go to parties and people are like, oh, you want something to drink? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't drink. Oh, okay. Can you get me this instead? Like water with some lemon in it or something. Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. You know, Okay. Like it's not a, th it's not a thing for me. It's not a thing for them. Or I don't mind standing up for myself. I wasn't a good girl, for example, in the doctor's office after I helped her diagnose me with PCOS. And she said, okay, now you have to do this, take this medication. Da, 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 da. And I questioned her. I said, why would I take medication for a disorder when it will not cure the disorder? And she literally blinked and looked at me like, what? <laughs> huh? You know, she was first a little like shocked that I questioned her authority and her game plan. But then she also was listening to the question. and like, yeah, why would you take medication that isn't going to get you any better? She got tongue tied for a minute. And I said, here's what, here's what I'm going to do instead. You know, and I'm 21 saying that to an adult physician. So it's important that you identify these ways in which you've been conditioned because it, it affects your behavior and your a sense of the ability to do what it is that you need to do for yourself, right? If you've, been, if you've been made to feel so afraid that you will not be loved unless you do what is expected of you, then yeah, that's a, that's a tough like line to toe always. That's an exhausting burden. And then doing anything you want, therefore, immediately feels isolating, but it need not feel that way at all. In fact, it shouldn't be. It should be that you do you, and the environment of our relationship is one that is inclusive, meaning if you don't drink and I do, and we're in a healthy relationship, then we can include both realities to coexist simultaneously without judgment or guilt or shame or whatever. Yeah. But if you're in dysfunctional relationships, and that can be family dynamics or societal dynamics, that can feel scary. And it's also true that the world is not inclusive fully yet of women's reality. And we see that most potently when it comes down to our biological rhythms, which is one of the reasons why I wrote this new book in the flow, because why is it that almost 50% of women are struggling with hormonal issues, weight struggles, blood sugar issues compared to men? Well, it's because first of all, we haven't been told about our second biological clock. It's called the infradian rhythm. I-N-F-R-A-D-I-A-N. And then anything that you're doing that is being researched on men, like high intensity interval training is the gold standard or intermittent fasting is the gold standard. And then you apply it to your infradian biological rhythm will disrupt your body and cause you to have things you don't want to happen to happen, like gaining weight or having anxiety or having brain fog or having disrupted periods and fertility and, and so on and so on. And so we need a culture in the wellness conversation, in the fitness conversation, in the medical conversation, in the corporate conversation that starts to become way more inclusive of the female biological reality. Because facts are facts. You can have opinions about whether or not you like things to be inclusive or not, and I hope that you want them to be inclusive. But the facts are male hormonal biology follows a circadian pattern, and therefore they have optimal timing to do workouts at a certain time of the day, to do deep work 
at work at a certain time of the day to socialize at a certain time of the day. And it literally is rinse and repeat every 24 hours. That's a fact. The other fact is that women are not tiny men and they have a 28 day in Fradian cycle that requires them to pick the timing to eat certain things at certain times like men, but just for their Fradian rhythm instead of circadian to work out at certain times at the right way across the cycle to, to do projects in optimal timing for them across the cycle. And both of those things can be true and must be, they, they must both be given space in a healthy societal relationship. Just like the friend who wants to drink and one friend who doesn't, those things should both be able to coexist, equally valid. And in our culture, we need to have the male experience of biological reality and the female one be included in our cultural narrative so that women can stop having all this imbalance, these unnecessary disorders of the of their hormones and to start to thrive in their lives. I love that. And how did you figure out about this infraradian clock? Because most of us, if we're our eating or workouts or our daily or weekly schedule is on that 24 hour clock, which to what you said is really centered yes. around men's hormones. Yeah. It's hurting <laughs> um, you. It's hurting you to live a circadian life exclusively. Now how did I figure this out? Well, that's the story of how I ended up writing a second you know, book, which is essentially that I was really excited about five years ago, seeing something that was historic taking place in the media. Millennials were starting to post pictures of themselves free bleeding on Instagram, bleeding through their pants, bleeding onto their beds, running marathons without any sanitary products, menstrual products. And uh, I thought, here we go, finally. Finally, we're going to normalize women's biology because these young millennials are like, this is ridiculous that this is a taboo. This is my body. This is what happens. I was so impressed with their forthrightness. And I said, this is the watershed moment. And I I was very encouraged that the media wellness outlets specifically really picked up on a lot of stories about normalizing menstruation. In fact, for two or three years in a row, menstrual normalizing was a trend, an annual trend as dictated by these annual forecasts that both Well and Good and Mind Body Green did. And I was featured in them. And I was so excited to see that we were finally having this historic meaning never before in all of recorded human history has there been ever any mass media conversation about menstruation in a positive way ever, ever. So I thought, perfect. Now there's content more content, more universal access via the internet by women all around this beautiful planet will equal more healthy women. The plague of women suffering unnecessarily with their health, with their weight, with their periods can finally end. And what I saw instead over those five years where I was tracking this trend was that in fact, no, this was not happening at all. Women were getting sick still and up to the tune of 47% of women suffering from hormonal issues. And when you compare it with the male cohort, it's like there's no comparison. Women are way sicker with hormonal imbalances than men. And I started asking the big question of what is going on? Why is this happening? Why is this the case? Because I'm a systems thinker and I like to get to the root cause of things. This is my nature. And what I found were two key things. The first thing that I found was that women were being left out of medical, fitness, and nutrition research. And that's really important because, for example, when you go and get general anesthesia, that dosage is titrated with an assumption that you are a tiny male. It's not that it's been specifically researched and documented and there have been female, females included in those human clinical trials. Right. It's and that's scary. That's, and that's true. Yeah. It's powerful. And it's and it's true across the board in drugs and everything. And it's such a problem that in 1996, the National Institute of Health put out a public request that women in their reproductive years be included in human clinical trials. As of 2016, the status report showed that progress has been extremely slim. So in 20 years, almost no new research has been done with women in human clinical trials. So that means anytime, and they know that they know how much of a liability that is, and they're really working hard in the medical establishment to figure out how to fix that. 
in the fitness and nutrition section, where it's not like, you know, let's say as life critical as, as the medical environment and complex to do the research, the, the fact that this gender gap in research still exists is really, really problematic for me because women are reading all these stories about, oh, the latest study shows that intermittent fasting for 18 hours a day is going to confer all of these enormous benefits on your health. It's going to reduce your weight, improve your cognitive health protect your brain from dementia. It's going to improve insulin sensitivity. It's going to increase cellular autophagy. It's, it's, the, it's the golden standard now of, of living a healthy life. Well, that research has not been done on you. That's been done on men and postmenopausal women. And I dug up some really interesting research that I put in the book about how, in fact, it's really dangerous that, that we're not having more transparency in these articles that says, hey, full disclosure, this study that shows this has only been done on this cohort. So if you're not part of that cohort, you should proceed with extreme caution because we don't know how it's going to affect you. But instead, we get the conversation that this is good for you and this is good for you and that's good for you. All the while, all of that research and all of those studies have been done only on men. And then we look at the fact that women are way sicker and more symptomatic reproductively than men, hormonally speaking. And it, no wonder why. They're reading all these articles, trying all these detoxes and workout programs and diets, and without realizing it, they're disrupting their biological rhythm at a profound level and having not just symptoms in the area that they were hoping to improve, let, let's say like, like weight loss, but then they actually have a whole new set of symptoms they didn't have before, like disrupted periods or things of that nature. And it's really, really upsetting to see that we've been misled so much without having all of this information really clearly laid out. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that I, dis I uncovered the infradian rhythm. You know, I am really proud to say that this book, In the Flow, is the first book to write about the infradian rhythm. And I've been doing lots of podcasts since the book came out at the end of January of this year, 2020. And I've been in conversations with medical doctors who have never heard of it before. And that's also a problem because it just, again, we're studying the heck out of the circadian rhythm because first of all, everyone has a circadian rhythm and it's extremely important. It affects multiple systems of your body. But women have this second biological rhythm that activates at puberty and deactivates at menopause, and it's called the infradian rhythm, and it affects six key systems of your body. It's equally important as the circadian rhythm for the, the decades that it's active. There's no research being done on it yet, and it's absolutely something that we have to factor in when we're, take, when we're thinking about how we have to work out, how we have to eat, because it affects your met metabolism and its speed, which I'll break out in a minute. So that led me to want to write this new book to explain these challenges that are unique to women in this, with the gender gaps that exist in research. And what the net effect of that has done is disrupted all of our infradian rhythms so profoundly that we're having a multitude of system problems, right? From brain chemistry, cognitive performance, weight issues, metabolic issues, immunological issues, microbiome issues, stress response issues, and reproductive issues, right? And what we don't need is a fix for our metabolism and a fix for our reproductive system. What we actually need to do is start supporting this deep, deep root cause, which is supporting the infradian rhythm. And then all those systems start to work optimally, which by the way, is exactly what the male biohackers are doing. They try to optimize that root support of the circadian rhythm and things start to work much better, right? So this is new science. It's in the field of biology. This is called chronobiology. And like I said, it's a relatively young division within biology as a whole. But even within that, really right now, only the circadian rhythm has been studied at length. And still, there's so much more research to do on that rhythm alone. But the, the infradian rhythm, it's a whole new green space of research that could be done that would benefit, you know, half the population and must be done. So in the book, I not only wanted to sort of share about these findings and explain why so many women are struggling 
but I also wanted to give the solution, a revolutionary solution to, for the first time, for women to really be able to get it right instead of throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping this workout will give you the results you want, or this diet will finally be the one that helps you lose those 10 pounds or this detox or what, you know, instead of playing this unending guessing game of disappointment and money wasted and time wasted, here is the exact biologically based system that will allow you to eat and exercise according to what is actually happening in your body to optimize its performance. And this is not just an academic thing for me. There's the proof is in the pudding. You know, I've been able to maintain, for example, a 60 pound weight loss for 20 years and a pregnancy where I gained like 40 pounds and lose that as well, because I know how your metabolism works and I know how to work with it. And it's so much easier than you have been told it is. I love that. And so can you tell us a little bit about that, about how this infrared rhythm affects how we work out, how it impacts sugar cravings, and what's going on with your metabolism? So this method that I'm about to tell you about, the solution that I created is called the cycle syncing method. And the three pillars of it are that you change what you're eating essentially once a week. So you have four different food patterns. You change how you're working out four times throughout the month, and you focus on different tasks four different ways over the month to align with the changes that the infradian rhythm creates in your metabolism, in your stress response system, and in your brain chemistry, right? You go with the flow. And this is what men do, by the way. They Let me just give you a little comparison here so that you know that it's a safe idea for you to try because I know you've been conditioned to ignore your biology on a fundamental level. So men, for example, they know they wake up with a lot of testosterone and cortisol. Sometimes they can see it in the form of an erection if they've gotten a good night's sleep, but they also feel the urge to move their bodies. Men optimally like to work out first thing in the morning, and that actually optimizes their performance cognitively for the rest of the day. So for men to take advantage of that testosterone when they wake up, to wake up early, to work out early, and to do as much of their deep work as early on in the day as they can allows them to take advantage of their circadian biological rhythm. And then later in the afternoon when they fall off the testosterone and cortisol cliff around three o'clock, they either use some biohack like nootropics or upgraded coffee to extend their energy and cognitive focus and stamina, or they start to socialize, which is where corporate culture and happy hour come from. It comes from this male hormonal pattern. So men have been doing this for centuries, and it's a very good practice because it allows you to get optimal results in the most efficient timing that you do have based on your biological mandates. So what I am suggesting that you do as a woman is understand what your biological patterns are and then just start to work with them. And so you have this infrading rhythm. You don't experience it in the course of a day. You experience it over the course of a month. And as I said, the, the monthly cycle, but it goes way beyond your period. It goes from your brain to your immune system, to your metabolism, your stress response system, your microbiome, and your reproductive system. So by optimizing your infradian rhythm and supporting it with the right diet, the right workouts, and the right work, like men do, you're going to start to have optimal performance in your brain, your immune system, your microbiome, your metabolism, your stress response system, and your reproductive system. So by doing one simple and elegant thing, everything else starts to work the way that it should. And that's how nature has designed itself to be a very efficient and elegant system, not one that requires one solution for your metabolism, one solution for your reproductive system, one solution for your microbiome. No, nature would never have designed a system that is so inefficient. It's more about going down to this very deep cause, which is deep root function, which is the infradian biological clock, which you've never known about. And so you've been by accident, disrupting it for many, many years and having all the fallout from all those systems of the body. So the infradian rhythm, how it affects your metabolism across your cycle. Let's first establish that you have four phases to your cycle, the follicular phase, the ovulatory phase, the luteal phase, and the bleeding phase. 
these four phases have unique hormonal ratios associated with each one. Some have low estrogen, some have high estrogen, some have estrogen and progesterone, and so it just and some have low estrogen and progesterone. And depending on which of these four phases, it's going to affect your metabolism, your stress response system, your immune system, all of those systems I keep mentioning. It has an impact on those systems of the body, a positive one, if you support it. If you don't support it, it will have a negative impact, right? Which is what's happening to all of us today because we're not supporting it. We didn't even know we needed to support it. And we've been having all these negative effects with our metabolism. So let's talk about the metabolism piece to start. In the first half of your cycle, which is the follicular and ovulatory phases of your cycle, your metabolism is slightly slower compared to yourself within the month, okay? Because in the second half, it's slightly faster, the luteal and menstrual phases, the luteal and bleeding week. So relative to yourself, the first half is a slower metabolic rate and the second half is a faster one. What that means practically is that in the follicular and ovulatory phases, you can and should and will feel comfortable eating fewer calories. And that is good. That will optimize your metabolic response. You will store fat as fuel. You will not disrupt blood sugar levels. It will work really well for you. In the second half, if you try to be a good girl, like you've been told to restrict calories every single day and work out hard really every single day, if you try to do that in the second half, when your metabolism has sped up and you legitimately need the documented 247 more calories per day during this phase, it's not just a, oh, it's sped up how many more calories you need. They've actually, this, they've, this they have studied. So you need almost 300 more calories a day in the second half of your cycle. When you eat that way, and you eat more blood sugar stabilizing carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, and you eat more calories overall, you're going to keep your blood sugar stable, you're going to burn stored fat as fuel, and you're going to optimize your weight, right? This is, the, this is one of the critical keys to the kingdom in your reproductive years when it comes to having a healthy metabolism and a healthy weight effortlessly, right? It is not about deprivation and restriction at all. It's about looking at the facts. The facts of your metabolism are two weeks out of the month, it's slightly slower. You can and should eat less. Two weeks out of the month, it's slightly faster. You can and must eat more. And when you do that, everything works really well and you will effortlessly maintain healthy weight. I want to also dip into the stress response piece because it affects how we work out and your overall weight. In the first half of your cycle, your resting cortisol levels are slightly lower, again, relative to yourself. In the second half, the luteal and the menstrual phases, resting cortisol is slightly higher relative to the first half of the cycle. What this means is that in the first half of the month, when resting cortisol is lower and when your resting metabolism is lower, you can and should, in order to optimize using stored fat as fuel and, and keeping blood sugar stable, you want to do higher intensity workouts with a cardio component like HIIT workouts and any cycling, cardio stuff, right? Running. In the second half, once you cross ovulation, you must not do HIIT workouts or cardio because resting cortisol is higher and you will burn through your adrenal reserve faster because you're already producing more cortisol even at rest which means then that your body will start to produce more cortisol, disrupt blood sugar, and program your body to store any fuel that you have as fat. Not to mention if you do HIIT workouts or high intense cardio workouts in the second half, you're going to turn on muscle wasting as well as turning on that fat storage that I just described. So once again, that you look at the science of what is so in your cycle in your life, in your metabolism, being affected by this infradian biological clock, eating the same way every day and working out the same way at the same time every day makes no sense, is illogical, and is bad for you. It's really good for guys because they, again, are on that rinse and repeat 24-hour clock. You are not. You are not a tiny male. You are not a smaller <laughs> version of a male with a weaker metabolism that needs constant restriction and 
killing yourself at the gym. You have an extraordinary infrading biological rhythm. You have a powerful and highly efficient metabolism because you have been encoded with the blueprints to reproduce tiny human beings, whether you choose to do that or not. Nature gave you the much more efficient metabolism and the much more efficient stress response. And so you have to understand how it works and then work with it. And that's what the cycle syncing method will help you do. In chapter four of the book, there's a chart just for the food. Chapter five of the book, there's a chart just for the workouts. And then in chapter six, what's really revolutionary is that you're going to get access to the world's first time management system that includes both your infradian rhythm and your circadian rhythm. Because when you're planning your day and your week and your month, you have to factor both in for your optimal health but also your optimal productivity. Again, men are doing this every day. That's what corporate culture, why it looks the way it looks, early morning meetings and late afternoon happy hours because that syncs with male hormonal patterns. You need to be able to do the same for yourself. And so I built a planner for myself that I've shared with everybody in the book that allows you to do that. So those are the three pillars of the cycle syncing method, eating, exercising, and planning your work in ways that are in alignment with that infradian shift. I love that. I'm, th- I'm thinking about how I remember being at a bachelorette party with the woman who was party. It was, she was a trainer and it was mostly all trainers and me. And I was always thinking like, oh, they have so much energy. And I was amazed at how they were all like pounding caffeine, right? Like all the time. And it makes me think about how we, if we look to trainers or these people who tend to do the same workouts all the time, we don't know what they're doing when they're not on Instagram or not in class, right? (laughs) In terms of having to compensate for doing the same hard workout all the time. And that catches up with you, right? Because then you are over caffeinating or you're overriding exhaustion, which often then leads to sugar, eating sugar, or you beat yourself up if if you couldn't push yourself as much, you know, in class every day the same way. And so I'm thinking of the downstream effects of not paying attention to this in terms of then the other choices that compound this even more. But I was just thinking like, wow, that's probably why trainers have so much energy. It's like, it's the over-caffeination to make up for (laughs) always working out so hard and so much. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really challenging for the fitness conversation. You know, for example, when you go into a class at a group fitness class, they're always an hour and that's not always appropriate for you right? If, especially yeah. if you're near the second half of your cycle, you need to be able to stop working out after about 30 minutes. So it'd be much more powerful for all of us to be on the same page, especially in the fitness environment. You know, men tailor their workouts. Do you notice that it's a slight, like there are less men in group fitness classes and more women, right? It's, yeah. so, it's so interesting. Men are just default setted, set to tailor the things that work for them individually. And women, we're taught to do what we're being told to do and yeah. not to not individuate. And so you see that playing out in the gym, like, oh, everybody's doing the same workout. Well, that's not appropriate, right? Because let's just pick any four women in the class. You're each going to be in a different phase of your cycle. And if you're all doing the same workout, you're each going to get really different effects on your biochemistry, if let's say two of you are in the follicular and the ovulatory phases and you're doing a kickboxing class, you're going to walk out of that class feeling like an amazing human being who crushed her workout. You're going to feel energized and you're going to have built some really awesome lean muscle and burned a lot of fat. If you are in that class and you're the other two women, one's in her luteal phase, one's in her bleeding week, you're going to walk out of that class so drained, blood sugar destabilized, hypoglycemic, right? Which Mm -hmm. may take you hours to recover from or a whole day. You're going to feel depressed and anxious because of all the destabilization with your blood sugar and your cortisol. And you're going to have lost lean muscle and gained fat. It is illogical that we're doing the same stuff at the same time. You have to be aware of your biological rhythms in order to optimize your outcomes. This is what female biohacking looks like. It's not the same as male biohacking. Male biohacking is essentially coming down to, if it, my take on it, and of course there are many nuances, and I respect all the exciting research and innovation that's coming out of this new 
industry of biohacking. But if I had to put it into a nutshell, male biohacking is really about how do we extend cognitive focus and physical stamina beyond that 3 p.m. biological cliff when testosterone and cortisol really decrease massively in blood serum concentration. And you see that with upgraded coffee. You see it with timing your work throughout the day. You see it with timing workouts. You see it with nootropics. You see it with using different extreme things like cryotherapy and heat saunas and all of this stuff, right? Female biohacking does not need to factor in this energy cliff. What we need to factor in is our infrading rhythm and simply just take care of it because you have this really extraordinary biological system that nature gave you. You don't have to do much to get a lot of results. Your baseline is supposed to be super stable mental focus, super stable energy, super stable metabolism, super strong immune system, super balanced stress response, healthy, vigorous sexual desire and response and healthy reproductive system and, and abundant fertility. That's how you've been designed. If you're not experiencing those things, it's not because you need to take nootropics or put things in your coffee. It's because you're eating, exercising and working in a way that's disrupting your infradian rhythm and you're going to feel compounded effects in all of these systems of your body, we just need to do things differently. We have different biological realities and they're both wonderful and equally valuable. And we just have to learn to take care of ourselves differently. We have to break free from this, you know, which really came out of this, this gender gap in the medical research, the assumption that, well, since we don't want to do research on women, let's just assume that they're smaller versions of men. Right. And that has had an enormous trickle down effect in our society, our cultural narrative and our own personal psychology. We literally assume that we should just do what the guys are doing. You know, like how many of us have heard of these power morning rituals, wake up at 5 a.m., do a big workout, do your deep work early, early in the day. Well, in fact, that's terrible for women because depending on where I, people ask me in interviews on magazines all the time, what's your morning routine? I said, it depends on where I am in my infradian rhythm. I have four different morning routines. And every day compared to my husband, I need 20 minutes more of sleep because I as a female have a much more complex brain than he does as a male. And I need the extra sleep to finish the self-cleaning process. So I would be doing myself a huge disservice by comparing myself and my life planning compared to men. Because if I woke up at the same time as my husband, he would be cognitively at an advantage the entire day and I would be disadvantaged because I didn't finish the self-cleaning process my brain needs to perform optimally, right? You see? So these little things that we just make these assumptions like, oh, I should be able to get up at the same time as the men in my life, whether you're in a heterosexual relationship or not, or I should be able to do the same workout that the guys are doing, or I should be able to do da 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 all of that is an assumption that you've been conditioned to believe because of this trickle-down effect of leaving women out of medical research, and it is costing you so much in your health and in your life. Yeah, and I just want to suggest for people out there, starting with, like, definitely get the book and start with the nutrition or exercise changes, because if you're in a traditional work environment, it's so helpful to experience the benefits and the results <laughs> with something that you can control more easily. And then you can, you know, ripple out into how you work and, and that kind of stuff. Cause sometimes we don't, it can be harder. Cause I mean, one thing I did feel after reading your book was like, oh, we can definitely like choose to, to, to live according to this infrared rhythm but the world is not set up for that yet. <laughs> and so it does require the word ruckus comes to mind. <laughs> like you do have to, I don't know, I, I think especially about the productivity and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It can be harder if you're working in a corporate culture or something like that. But I think it's so important for people. Like I was telling you before we started, I, I recommended your book to one of my clients and she decrease the intensity of her workouts. And she's like, I lost three pounds. <laughs> and so it's like, now that she has that like realization and like, wow, then it can be easier to then have the confidence to, you know, to then adapt to the work as well and change it according to, to your point, the different routines in the morning or the way that yeah. we, 
So I mean, listen, it becomes a fun game and don't get overwhelmed. We often can feel like, oh no, I have to change everything. When you start using the cycle syncing method, the first thing you want to start with is eat, pick one, change your workouts or change your food. Follow the chart. There's recipes and meal plans in the back of the book. You can also make it much easier for yourself and join us at the cycle syncing membership.com where you can be part of a humongous community of women who have seen the light about their infradian rhythm and are doing this and getting all the support tools together. So you'll get recipes, grocery lists, meal plans for each phase of your cycle. You get workout videos for each phase of your cycle. You get all the support around your time management. And then of course you get ongoing classes with me where I'm helping you address this issue that you just brought up, which is, you know, what if the things that are good for me don't jive with the circadian world, essentially, right? What if my boss wants me to do a project on deadline and it's not in my optimal phase or something to that effect? Well, there's ways to work with that that don't drain you if you know how to navigate both the circadian and the infradian, which is what that whole time management planner is all about. Because it isn't about isolating yourself and, and abandoning the world around you. Not at all. I, I live in the world. I function within the world. I run a company. <laughs> I have a husband. I, you know, totally no problem. I, you know, you live in both the circadian and the infradian and you just have to learn. How, it's just building a new skill of how to learn it. But I don't want you to assume that it's one or the other. It's not. It's both. But what you have been doing is one or the other. You've just been doing the circadian. But that's not the solution is not to drop the circadian and only live in the infradian. The solution is to do both because both are happening inside of your body. And there's a very straightforward way to take care of all of this. And that's what I've outlined in the book. But don't bite off more than you can chew. Start with one thing and build your confidence and start to see like you're, you were saying one of your clients lost weight for the first time effortlessly by working out less and doing it at the right timing. Well, that's what can happen, not just with your weight. It can happen with your PMS symptoms. Those can start to evaporate really quickly. It can start to happen with the fact that you are getting things done that you've been putting off on your to-do list. All of a sudden, you're going to have more and more energy freed up from not being under the rock of infradian disruption and you're going to start to be more efficient, more productive, more creative. It's a wonderful a wonderful new way to live and not just take care of our weight and our health. That's not the destination, weight management. And I'm somebody who's been obese. So, you know, for me, I, that's still not the destination in my life of having the perfect weight. The destin that's the foundation, right? Having your health working for you is your foundation off of which you springboard into creating the life that you want and using your talents to help the world around you. That's why we're here, not to have the perfect pants size. I mean, that's a whole other piece of mythology I think is really toxic for women. Your destination in life is not to look perfect. Yeah. You're like a unique snowflake. You hit the jackpot of the genetic Russian roulette, you know, the sperm and the egg that created you out of the infinite <laughs> statistical analysis of that is pretty extraordinary. You're here, you have this one wild and precious life. You want to take care of your body in a way that's efficient so that you can then use all of that life force energy to use your talents that are unique to you in whatever way makes sense, because that will have such a positive impact on the world. And I, I'm really convinced that if we had all women firing on all cylinders, the world would be transformed. Yeah, especially because I think about, and in ways of, and especially when you talk about filing on all cylinders, that also means we would value rest. And, you know, you talk about yeah. your menstrual week, do nothing instead of working out. And I, I love how you talk in the book about, like, we expect to feel the same way every day, and we think we should be in this perpetual harvest. Yeah. That really resonated with me. And it's, so it's like, it's not about going, 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 productivity, productivity, productivity. It's understanding, I think, and this is why I love your take on things is like when you really understand how you're built, I just think there's this increased awe for your body and everything that's happening and, and how elegant it is, which is just, it just puts you in awe of your body rather than thinking it's just about a size or something like that. Well, or feeling like it's a fight 
you know, yeah, yeah. like your body's always betraying you or working against you or what's wrong with it, that it won't be the size you want or whatever. When you get the correct information about who you are, biologically speaking, biochemically speaking, biological, rhythmically speaking, totally changes your opinion of yourself. It totally changes the relationship you have to your body and it totally changes your life, period, pun intended. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> And imagine if you had been given this information right before you got your first period, that you were going to have this incredible biological rhythm that gets activated, a second biological clock unique to women that imparts tremendous gifts metabolically, immunologically. There's so much we didn't go into today that's in the book, brain-wise and that it's unique to you and you only have access to it for about four decades. It stops at menopause and it's, it's a privilege how you would have felt about yourself during those pubescent years, how you, that would have affected the entire trajectory of your life. Whatever that feeling is you're feeling right now, as I speak those words, that feeling is the pain of the opportunity cost of not having had this information at the correct time. And I hope and I bring these difficult things up not to rant and rave, but because I hope that it gives you the passion, some of the passion that I feel, so that you start to make these changes for yourself. Because I know what it was like when I was struggling with my PCOS, and for that whole decade from 12 to 22, not having the correct information, not having the correct plan, that decade is, I cannot get that time back right? That precious decade. And I don't know how many decades it's been for you or how much time it's been for you, but I know that journey that it's a, it's a little unfortunate that we've all had to go through this, but it makes getting it, reclaiming it for yourself so much sweeter. Yeah, totally. And, and I do want to mention that in the book, you even talk about how to adapt this to perimenopause post-pregnancy, and even, even menopause, right? When you start to understand your hormones, even if they're, you're not bleeding, but menopause is a powerful passage rather than the cultural narrative of like, you're done, <laughs> you know? There's, there's always still time too, I think, you know? Yeah, to, no, I mean, the book is almost 400 pages, so there's a yeah. lot in the book. Um, I, I threw, flew through it. It was so fascinating. Like, it was just like, oh my God. I, women, I, women are really responding in a similar way that they, it's like you feel sponge-like when you encounter this information because it's the thing you've, needed but didn't know you were missing kind of a feeling. Mm -hmm. So you just have this voracious excitement about learning about it. And I don't shy away from being technical in the book and scientifically accurate. I know I've had some feedback about, you know, oh, you know, you're, you're too academic and women are not going to like that. I'm like, no, no, no. Women are hungry for that. They want the academic stuff. Of course, it wasn't women who were saying that to me. Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, God. so I go into that. I go into in the book as well, what if your period is dysfunctional? What if you have PCOS? What if you have missing periods? What if you have amenorrhea? What if you're on the pill? How does this impact your ability to access your infrating rhythm? What does it mean? There's a whole biohacking toolkit in there that helps talk through all those issues. So no stone is left unturned. Every question is answered. And the whole plan, chart by chart by chart, everything is laid out so that it is goof proof for you to really start finally taking care of yourself in a way that's going to really change things for you, the ways that you've always hoped other things would have but could never have been possible because they were based on a different biological reality. Yeah. And you even get into parenting too, which we didn't get into, but how you can use your cycle to, you know, and, and how you parent as well. So it's not just work. It's par It's like every area of life. And again, to kind of tie it back to sugar cravings, it's like we often want to reward ourselves when we're making things harder than they are, than they need to be <laughs> with sugar, or we get so exhausted from our workouts or we don't nap <laughs> so during our period and we, we push through with workouts and then we, we need it you know, sugar for energy. But I feel like your plan is so elegant and can so help people feel safe in feeling different and using each phase for what it is designed to do and 
firing on all, all cylinders, as you said. So thank you so much for this. It's a health book, but it's an important contribution to feminism as well, right? <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. What can I say? I, I love, through the lens of what I've studied as for female biology, it's hard not to be awestruck and be in love with all things female. And if anything, this book is like my love letter to your body. And hopefully that love letter to your body will help you finally make peace with her and be in love with her too, because that's what you deserve. I love that. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you thank for you. having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Elisa. And we will have links to your site and the book and all that stuff. And is there anywhere else where you'd like people to find you? I know you guys also, you also have a very great Instagram account as well. Yeah, you can find the Instagram account at Flow Living or my personal one is at Elisa.vd. If you want all the free, amazing gifts that come with the book, go to intheflowbook.com and download those there. And if you need any help with your hormones at all, go to flowliving.com for our programs, our one-on-one coaching, our spectacular female biohacking supplements. And if you need the cycle syncing app, that's myflowtracker.com. That will really help you start to really understand which phase you're in and what to do when. And like I said earlier, if you want to join us and all the other cycle syncers, come to the cyclesyncingmembership.com. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real and liberating. Mm-hmm.